Judah is in rapid moral and spiritual decline, and to the east the wicked nation of Babylon is rising, devouring its adversaries, as the Assyrian Empire continues its fall. King Nebuchadnezzar II leads the Babylonians as the new dominant force in the land. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Throughout time, Babylon's rise and fall, and always God is sovereign. God came from Taman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of His praise. His brightness was like the light rays flashed from His hand, and there He veiled His power. This is the book of Habakkuk, trusting God in troubled times. remember on this Memorial Day weekend, I know Travis mentioned, but just to, uh, to remember as we go throughout this weekend uh, the lives that were lost so that we could have the freedoms that, that we have uh, together here in this place uh, today, uh, th those that gave the ultimate sacrifice so we can have the freedoms that we enjoy. If you have your Bibles, we're in the book of Habakkuk. It's our second week uh, in the study, uh, Trusting God in Troubled Times, trusting God in troubled times. We're going to be in verses uh, 12 of chapter 1 through chapter uh, verse 1 of chapter 2 uh, this morning. We're going to cover this section where we see uh, Habakkuk responding to God. And we uh, found out last week as I asked some of you how many of you were involved in the career that you set out to or that you wanted to be a part of in high school. There was seven of you, so like one percent of you were committed to actually following through with what you set out to do in high school. But for me, uh, what I wanted to do back then was to be an architect. Uh, growing up, uh, my dad had multiple businesses, and one of them was uh, roofing. And I don't know what's going on uh, nowadays. Like some of my buddies that are in roofing, my stepbrother owns a roofing company. My brother is in roofing. Nowadays, you just get like these really, really nice trucks, and you just go around and you check on other people and you bid jobs. Like back in the day, at least for my dad, it didn't it didn't work like that. Uh, he was actually up on the roof with uh, a worker or a buddy of his roofing the house. And me, at the age of eight or ten, I'm down there on the ground cutting a ridge cap and then dragging this little bitty magnet uh, around the yard when we're done to make sure we got all of the, I'm sure there's something way more, way better now, but to make sure we got all the nails picked up. It was the tiniest magnet, like this big, like for a, a whole yard. It could have been just to keep me busy, I don't know, but uh, I grew up doing that. And then my first real job, like where I got paid, uh, other than just getting to eat and to live in the house that I grew up in, my first real job that I got paid was when I was 15, and that was framing houses, uh, and that was for a guy out in Godley. And back then, Godley was, uh, there was about six houses there uh, total, and I think we may have built uh, all of them uh, at that time. But I was always involved in construction. I loved construction. I loved building. And so in high school, I wanted to be an architect. And something that I know about building is there's a process to it. Uh, you have the dirt work, and then you put uh, the underground plumbing in, and then you put down the foundation, and then the, the framers come, and you frame up the walls, and you put in the rafters and the joists, and you put on the decking, and then you get it dried in, and then you do the, the rough uh, electrical, and then you put up the drywall. There is a process that you go through, and you don't want to get out of order in the process. And one thing that is for certain that you must get right is the foundation. It's the foundation. Like, I'm sure many of you have been to some of your homes. You have beautiful houses, and I've never once, and I'm sure you've never once, pulled up to your house and been like, man, the foundation on this bad boy. What a beautiful foundation. Those concrete guys, they did excellent work. 
Like, we don't think about that, do we? How you pull up and you look at the brick or the, the rock or the paint or the batten board or whatever you, you have going on at your house. You pull up and you look at that. You don't think about the foundation, but it's key. It's crucial. You don't think about it, but if it's not done right, if it's not solid, you will soon know. See, when it comes to our faith, the foundation that it sits upon is key. It's key. We look at our lives, and we look at our good works, and we look at how we serve our community, and we look at all these aspects of our faith, how we love others, how we care for others. But like framing and shingles and brick, apart from what our faith resides upon, it's all worthless. It's all useless. The, the foundation of our faith is in God and Him alone. He is unchanging, immutable. He's consistent. He's trustworthy. He never violates His own character. And see, a proper understanding of God, having our foundation firm and understanding that, understanding who God is, helps us to rightly process the circumstances that we face in this broken world. So as we continue and we see this response from Habakkuk this morning, it reminds us that a proper understanding of who God is is necessary as we walk through troubled times. Habakkuk chapter 1. If you would stand, let's begin in verse 12. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying this net and mercilessly killing nations forever? I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. This is God's word. Let's pray. God, this morning we come together in this place, and God, we, we thank um, you uh, for how you gifted those that have served our country, that have, have paid the ultimate sacrifice that we can be free. God, we ask today that you would comfort their families. We ask today that we would honor them. God, we pray for those in Uvalde in a tough week, in a horrible situation. God, we lift those families up to you. We lift that community up to you. We stand here this morning not understanding, broken. And God, we ask that you would bring healing. Lord, as we look at your word, God, I ask today that we would be reminded of the foundation that we have. When the winds come, when the storms rattle us, may we be reminded from your word of who you are, that we have stability if we are in you. God, we ask now that you would use your word. God, I ask that you would make my words your words. God, simply speak through me. Exalt your name. Make yourself known. It is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. 
So last week uh, we saw as we began this study of the book of Habakkuk in about 600 B.C. He is having this dialogue with God. He is pleading for, for God to show up to do something. Uh, the people in Judah where Habakkuk is are, are wicked, they're immoral. And God is sending the Babylonians to judge them, to discipline them. And Habakkuk is wrestling with this. And we talked about that like most prophets, we have the prophet speaking to the people on behalf of God. We find Habakkuk speaking to and dialoguing with God on behalf of the people. But Judah was involved in all sorts of immorality. They were doing things that were against the law of God. And so the Babylonians are being raised up to come and to overtake them. In Habakkuk's opinion, this is just something he can't get his mind around. He can't comprehend it. Yeah, God, I know we're not doing well, but why them? Why that this horrible army... Why are you sending them? And Habakkuk can't reconcile this. He just can't get his mind around it. He is frustrated. So he is complaining. And today in our verses we find this complaint and we hear his frustration as he cries out to God in response to what God is going to do. The first thing that we see is that Habakkuk is perplexed by the response, but affirming who God is. He's perplexed by the response, but he's affirming who God is. See, Habakkuk is a a difficult book. It's a difficult book to work through, to understand. When we look at this part, certainly the first chapter or two, and we see this conversation of what's unfolding, it's hard for us to understand. But I want to encourage you this morning, we find Habakkuk in the, the very same place. What is this? What are you doing, God? Why this? The first thing that that he does in this complaint is he affirms who God is. Look at verses 12 and 13. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. You have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? He's trying to reconcile this news that he just received from God. He's trying to process it. He's like, God, I know who you are. I know you, but I don't understand this. I'm proclaiming, I'm reminding myself that you are everlasting, that you're eternal, that you have no beginning and no end. You're the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, that you stand outside of the restraints of time. You're eternal, and he calls God Yahweh. He's saying that he's eternal, he's everlasting, but he is a God that covenants with his people. That he's actively involved. See, Habakkuk is affirming these things. Yahweh, you have a people that you have set apart, that you are working through. Like we see in Exodus chapter 6, verses 2 through 8, we see God speaking to Moses. It says, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Is God Almighty? But my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Verse 5, moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. Verse 7, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. 
I will bring you into the land I swore to give Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob. I will give to you for a possession. I am the Lord. See, God has a people, a covenant people that he is faithful to, that he will not fail. But when the people get out of line, the people are disciplined, but he is actively involved in a people that are set apart for his purposes. He's actively involved. We see Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then here we have Habakkuk recognizing that that Yahweh is the God that is eternal, but Yahweh is the God that is with them, working through them. See, Habakkuk says, it is my God. It's my God, my Holy One. So he says that God is everlasting, he's eternal, he's Yahweh, he's eternal, but he also draws near, he also sets apart, he's also with his covenant people working in and through them. Throughout time, he, he's using them, but he's also personal, he's my God, Habakkuk it says, my Holy One. And because of his holiness, because of his holiness, his people should strive for holiness. They should live lives that are consistent with the law that he has given them. And holiness means that they should be set apart. They should be set apart. That Their lives should look different. He's the holy one. Verse 13, you are of purer eyes than to see evil. And you cannot look at it wrong. See, God is holy. He is holy. He is set apart. He has called his people to be set apart, to flee from from sin, any transgression against the law of God. And when people do sin, when his people do go against what he has told them to do, there is judgment. Verse 12, he says, you have ordained them as a judgment. But he still affirms, O rock have established them for reproof. So even in Habakkuk's wrestling, he's affirming who God is, that he's everlasting, he's eternal, that he is the rock, that he is his God. He is with his people. In his struggle, he is reminding himself as he argues with God, as he complains to God, he's reminding himself of who God is. This is what I know of you. This is who you are. I don't like this. This isn't cool. This isn't how I would draw it up, but I know who you are. You are holy. You are everlasting. You are the rock. You are my God. He's saying, I I know you. I know your character, and I know you only act in accordance with your character. You are God. You can only act in accordance with your character. See, Habakkuk, in his struggling, in his wrestling, is affirming who God is. He knows who God is. See, and this is crucial for us in any day and time for God's people to understand who he is. Where we find ourselves... What we know of God matters when we're going to navigate difficult seasons. We can stand and we can say, you you are the rock. You are the redeemer. You are my God. You are everlasting. As a church, that's why our, our theology of God matters. We have a foundation that we understand that we are secure in. Over the last year, the deacons have read through our statement of faith as a church, the Baptist Faith and Message 2000s. The elder candidates, we went through it with them. I'm currently going through it in staff meeting with the staff. Every new member coming into membership is reading it. Why? Because it articulates. It's a systematic way of saying, this is what the church believes. This is our stance on the scriptures. This is our stance on who God is. See, is this people, we don't all have to be 
scholars, but we must dig deep into understanding his word, understanding who he is. It gives us guardrails. We can unapologetically say, this is my God. This is who he is. This is how he works, even when we don't like it. See, Habakkuk lived in a time where there was immorality, where people wanted to adapt God to their liking, to fit who they wanted him to be. And Habakkuk is saying, you are my God. This is who you are. This is how you operate. I affirm that. But see, we must be careful. We must be careful in the day and time that that we live in. People are all around us trying to adapt God or have him conform into their liking. And even sometimes with with good intentions, they're saying, I experienced, I this, I that. We must first go to his word, how he has revealed himself to us in his word. But a recipe for failure is over and over and over again. Saying, well, I don't think God would do that. Well, I don't think God would judge that sin. Well, that seems unloving. Well, times are different now. Because over and over again, we must come back to the word of God. We must come back to who is he? Who is he? Yes, he can use your experiences, but who God is is revealed to us in his word. We affirm that. We we say no matter what it is, even when we don't get it, we're not trying to shape God to fit into some mold that we have created. We're saying this is who God is. You are holy. You are righteous. You are everlasting. See, the question isn't what you think of God. The question is who is God? And our view of the word of God, which is how he chose to reveal himself to us. We must hold it up and say, and this is who God says he is. We affirm that. We've got to get our our minds around that that he's everlasting. He's holy. He's the rock. Even when we can't comprehend it, Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, Habakkuk is taken back by the response he gets from God, but he's still affirming, you are God. You are the foundation. You are the rock that my faith is built upon. And because of who you are, because you are holy, because you are righteous, you will hold people accountable for sin. A holy God must judge sin. Habakkuk knows that. So the first thing that we see is Habakkuk is perplexed by the response, but affirming who God is. Secondly, he's perplexed by the response, and he's awaiting a further answer. So next he he shifts into this metaphor of Babylon and these fish. And if you're not tracking, it kind of gets a little weird. you got to remember this is a a lament. This is poetic. But here's what he's diving into. He's saying that Babylon and this whole thing going on is like fish and crawling things. Look at verses 14 through 16. You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet. So he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net. Remember this part. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them, he lives in luxury and his food is rich. See, the thought here, catch this, is that Babylon is swallowing people up like fishermen dragging fish out of the sea with the equipment that they have, their nets, their drag nets. They're just hauling in nations. They're just swallowing up people with the resources that they have at their disposal, the, the hooks, the nets, the drag nets. 
and they're uh, seeming to enjoy what they're doing, inflicting this pain on others. They're enjoying it. And the more that they conquer, the wealthier they become. They have a, a life of luxury, it says. They're rich when it comes to food. What's going to come of this? That's what Habakkuk's saying here. They're just dragging people up. They're just conquering space. They're just using their nets. They're using their dragnets. They're using the resources. They're using the military equipment that they have just to swallow up everyone around them. And they're coming here. They're coming to Judah. This is your plan, God. This is what you're going to do. They're going to swallow us up next. Well, what's going on? Is this going to continue forever? Look at verse 17. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? I want you to, to feel this struggle. This week for me, it's just been a place of like tension, struggling with this text. I want you to feel that. This stuff's going on around him. He knows God is good, but he's in this place of like, what is, what are you doing? Why are you doing it like this? I know you're the rock. I know you're everlasting, but why this way? Why these people that are more wicked than us coming to judge us, coming to discipline us that are just emptying their nets and filling it up over and over again with more people that they are conquering? Why them? You can just sense with what Habakkuk is saying, his frustration, the, the tension. How do I reconcile this, God? How do I reconcile what you're saying with who I know you are? What do I do with this? This metaphor of the nets, the, the power, the, the resources the Babylonians have at their disposal is to inflict harm on others. It's said that they worship their nets, verse 16. They worship their nets. They make sacrifices to his net, make offerings to his dragnet. It's these tools and these abilities. They're worshiping them. They're worshiping them as they conquer those around them. Uh, like a, a fisherman reveres his net. For, for them, they're worshiping their, their power. They're worshiping their wealth. They're worshiping what they have. It's said that Nebuchadnezzar II, under his leadership, he rebuilt and expanded the city. It was one of the, the greatest places in the ancient world. As they accumulated wealth and conquered those around them. But the whole time they're exchanging truth of God for a lie. Romans 1.25. They're exchanging that for a lie. They're just taking people and they're worshiping their resources. They're celebrating their success. And their success has become or is their God. I want, you to, I want you to catch that. For the Babylonians, their success is their God. And I think for us as Christians, we need to take note of that. We need to remember that. Because we can fall into this trap. I, I can certainly speak for the guys in the room. We can fall into this trap. Our success, our money, our position can become our God. Whatever authority, whatever power that we have, it's like as men, sometimes what drives us to do great things, those successes can become our God. It can become an idol. We should take this as a warning as God's people, men and women, to, to look out for this, to be watchful. Don't let your success, don't let your money, don't let your position become your God. See, the Babylonians, they had, they had much success. They, they conquered others. And lead, needless to say, Habakkuk, he's just wrestling with this. He doesn't know what to do with this. So, so what's he going to do? What's, what's his response? What's, what's his plan? Well, when we go through things that we don't understand, 
He's left with the same thing that, that we're left with. All these years later, what we can do is we can wait. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. I will take my stand at my watch post, and I will station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. All I can do is wait. In Hebrew, it's military language. He's taking his post. He's standing firm. He's at attention. I'm waiting here on the lookout. What are you going to do? I'm waiting on you, Lord. I'm waiting. And maybe we don't know for sure. Maybe Habakkuk had a position of that where he was a watchman. Like we see in Ezekiel 3, 17. Son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them a warning from me. But, but no matter the case, whether it's literal or, or figurative, he's saying that he is going to watch. He is going to just wait. He is going to be on the lookout for what the Lord is going to do. Perplexed by it all, but standing and waiting for a further answer. And he can wait in confidence that God will be who God is, that he is unchanging, that he is consistent, that he is everlasting, that he is the rock, that God will act consistent with his character. See, listen, church, a proper understanding of, of who God is is necessary. It's necessary for Habakkuk as he's dealing with this information that God has given him. It's necessary for us to have a proper understanding of who God is as we face troubled times, as we go through difficulties. You can cry out to God. You can be upset with God. You can complain to God. But he is unchanging. He is working things together for his good. He is working things together for his kingdom. He is working things together to make us look more like Jesus. He has a plan. He is working throughout time. But a proper understanding of he is, it will keep you stable. It will keep you grounded. It will help you to respond rightly in storms. It will cause you to look at things from a godly perspective. And it will comfort you in your waiting. That God isn't just sitting idly by. He knows when to bless Judah. He knows when to bless Israel. He knows when to bring judgment. He knows when to raise up the Babylonians. He knows when to raise up the Roman Empire. And in the fullness of time, Christ comes. He is working throughout history. And we see just a, a small, little, bitty picture that we can't comprehend in our own life. But he is working all things for his glory to make them new. And since sin entered the world in the garden, he's establishing his kingdom. So if you've turned from your sin, if you've come to a place where you've recognized who you are outside of Christ, that you're a, a sinner that can't possibly earn your way to him. But in his great kindness and mercy, he sent Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, to live a sinless life on your behalf, to die on the cross, to bleed on the cross on your behalf for your sins. To come up from the grave three days later, sit ruling and reigning at the right hand of the Father. If you believe that, if you've put your faith in him, if you've trusted in him, you have life. You have a foundation that is secure. No matter what you face, no matter what comes your way, you are on firm Throughout history, he is working a plan. And the center of his plan in this age is the church, the bride of Christ. See, so no matter where you find yourself, 
If you're one of God's people, if you're on that firm foundation, he is for you. He is faithful. He will act consistent with his character. His interest is that you're reconciled, you're brought into right relationship with him. And then from that point, nothing stops him for for working things together that you would look more like Jesus. And he will stop at nothing to draw you closer to himself. To the point that a sinless Savior died on your behalf. See, and although your foundation is secure in him, it doesn't mean that the tough times won't hurt. It doesn't mean that what you face won't be difficult. It doesn't mean, and even today, you might be in a place where you're just confused. You're perplexed by it all. Like, why this? Why are you doing this, God? Why me? Why this time? Why am I struggling with this? What is going on? I can tell you that you're not alone. I might not have the answers, but I can tell you you're not alone. Habakkuk is struggling with the same thing. And maybe what you need to do right now is wait. Maybe you just need to wait. You need to keep pressing into him. You need to keep affirming who he is. You need to keep learning more about God. And you need to wait. And maybe begrudgingly. See, if I'm catching what's going on here in Habakkuk, he's not feeling good about this. He's going to be at the watch post. He's going to be waiting. But he might have his arms folded. I'm waiting on you, Lord. I know who you are. I don't like this. I don't know what you're doing. This doesn't seem right. But I know you're holy. I know you're good. I know you're the rock. I I know you're where my faith resides. So I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait and see how this plays out. I'm going to wait and see what you're going to do. Nothing I can do about it. So I'm just going to embrace it. I'm going to wait. I'm going to see. Love this quote from Charles Spurgeon. As I have learned to kiss the waves that throw me up against the rock of ages. See, in the waiting and the pain and the struggling and even in the discipline. It's in those seasons that the more that we know about God, the more we are able to rightly look at the horrible things that are happening around us. Because we can say that he is unchanging, that he is consistent, that he is trustworthy, that he is immutable, that he never violates his own character. And a proper understanding of who God is, is the foundation upon which our faith resides. So if you find yourself today, in a season of waiting. And trust in God. Wrestle with him. Cry out to him. Wait. He will act. He is working it all together. There is a purpose. He is establishing his kingdom. And it is much bigger and is much greater than we can ever imagine. But we must press into him. We must rightly understand who the God that we serve the God that brought us into relationship with us, of us rightly understand who he is. And that'll help us through the troubled times. Let's pray. God, we thank you today for these words from Habakkuk. We thank you for all these years later, how it's still applicable to us. The struggle, the not knowing, the the why this, God, why are you doing this? There's some in this room this morning that are in that exact place. They're questioning why. They don't understand it. But God, we know that you're good. We, We affirm who you are. 
we affirm that, that you are the rock. We affirm that you are holy. We affirm that you are righteous. We affirm that, that you act consistently with, with who you are. And we can trust in that. You'll always be the same. God, we just give it to you. We know that from our perspective, we don't get it and we may never get it. So God, for those that are waiting, God, I ask that you give them strength. I ask that in this season, they would deepen their understanding of you. They would bring themselves around other people that know you, that can give them wisdom, that can point them to you, the one that is the foundation of their faith. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that, that maybe there, there's some in the sound of my voice that don't know you. They're going through it. They're experiencing all sorts of things, but they don't have a foundation. They're on sinking sand. God, if there's anyone here that, that doesn't know you, God, I ask today that you would act, that you would move, that you would make them aware of their sin that they would fall on their face and repent of their sin and put their faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. That you would save their soul. God, I, I beg of you, I plead with you to, to do that in, in the lives of anyone in the sound of my voice that doesn't know you. God, for those of us that do, I ask that we would keep wrestling with the tension that we're learning in this book. That you're sovereign, that you're in control. But sometimes we just don't understand the troubled times. But we trust you. And it is in Christ's name we pray.